Hi, I'm Michael Goodfriend, and I'm the executive producer of the Play On podcast. You know, William Shakespeare did not write simple stories. His greatest masterpieces like Hamlet and A Midsummer Night's Dream and all the plays that we hear about are wide ranging, complex, epic tales with plots and subplots and twists and turns that are dizzying from any perspective. If you ask any Shakespearean actor or scholar or director how best to understand these plays, most of them will tell you that you have to see them on stage to really get what's going on. But what if you can't see the play? Well, the next best thing, of course, is to hear the play. And if we're doing our job right here at Next Chapter Podcasts, hearing the play on podcasts will make things clearer even than if you were able to see the play. Even with that, though, it's almost impossible to really get what's going on without a little guidance, some type of synopsis or roadmap to help us really understand these plots. Well, that's where Louis Douthat comes in. Louis was the director of literary development and dramaturgy for 25 years at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and she supervised the Play On project before becoming the president and co-founder of Play On Shakespeare. We've had Louis on for bonus content uh, in the past, and we got the full story, the origin story of the Play On series, but we haven't had her with us to really examine these stories in detail. That's why she's here today to talk with us about King Lear. She's just the person to help us understand it a little bit better, and I'm really glad to have her here with me. Welcome, Louis. Thank you, Michael. You know, I, I should change that a little bit. I wasn't. It was. I was at Oregon for 25 years, but not uh, all the whole time as a uh, you know head of the department. But always literary. It was always um, my entry was always literary. You worked with playwrights on new plays, and you also worked on dramaturgy for the Shakespeare plays at OSF. Is that correct? Yeah, that was the beautiful um, part of one of the beautiful parts about being at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And you so well know that as an actor in the company that you got to be in a, a range of plays over the course of a, a season, which was ranging from six to 10 months for you as an actor, and that you got to stretch yourself in different um, in different ways in, in terms of genre and in terms of space, where was it being, the kind of character you were playing, um, working on a new play or working on a classic. My, my entry into all this, Michael, is that all plays are new plays, including Shakespeare, who was a, a new playwright once too. And um, uh, how do we try to, can we possibly go back as if for the first time to experience these stories as an audience would have 400 years ago? I think it's an impossible question to answer really. Um, but that's my interest in making them fresh again uh, and having us hear them as if for the first time. Can you take us back to the conversation you had with Marcus Gardley when you proposed King Lear? Was it you that proposed King Lear to him? Oh, no, I, th I, think, it, I think it was the ambitious Marcus Gardley who wanted King Lear. I mean, even at that time, this is Marcus's extraordinary poet, uh, theater maker, uh, writer. And even then, which was in 2015 or something like that, he was incredibly busy. And I had this sense he was about to really ascend, which he has. I'm delighted to know that more people are now being able to hear and see and feel, most importantly, feel Marx's words and, you know, the effect that they have on characters and how they have effect on us. And at that time, I said, really, King Lear? I mean, that's a that's a tall order. He said, no, no, he wants to take on King Lear. I said, all right. You know, uh, it, it, it was generally better, Michael, if the playwright got it to choose the play that they kind of had a thing for. You know, I think we've talked to Sean San Jose about his Coriolanus. Same thing. I mean, he wanted Coriolanus. So I was like, oof. Um, and similarly here with Marcus. I mean, he really wanted to take it on. And... You know, there, there's some interesting textual um, 
pieces about some of these plays, as you mentioned, uh, like a Hamlet or a Richard III um, and a King Lear, for sure. In that the, and Romeo and Juliet, in that there are different versions that were published in Shakespeare, during Shakespeare's lifetime. And, you know, what constitutes the authentic text, authorial text? I, I don't know. But I said I want him to do the longest one because I wanted my money's worth in the translation exercise. <laughs> so that often if you pick up a, a version of... Um, you know, uh, an edition of King Lear, it, it will be something that's called a conflated version when it has pieces from quarter one or quarter two and, and from the folio kind of pick the best pieces. Um, in one version, the, 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 court, the trial scene does not happen, right? And in other versions, who has the last line <clears throat> in the play differs. And I find that all kind of very fascinating uh, for, the, for the sheer reason that these documents still are living documents in a weird way, right? They are two-dimensional art objects that give us a clue on how to do them three-dimensionally. You know, I might add to your comments at the beginning, Michael, that reading them is also a great way to have access to them if you can't sort of see a performance or get to a performance or even hear them on, on, on these podcasts, which are so great, and in other ways too. Um, King Lear has been filmed 20 times or something like that. It's, you know, it's a, it's a very popular play to be filmed as well. So, but, but reading is also an, an entry into the work. And I was thinking about that on the way over um, to my office in prep for this conversation today, because uh, in the rhythm of a play, it's very hard to kind of stop and have an argument with the character or with yourself or what, what, you know, what's going on. You can kind of, you know, like, clap or yay or boo or hiss, but that's not a lot of a, that's not a huge exchange. But when you're reading, you have the luxury uh, of sort of stopping and kind of really assessing what just happened. Is it true what just, what somebody just said? Do you believe what just had? Is that your belief about the way things should be? You know, so there's a, there's a different exercise. Um, and my interest has always been in performance and in the rhythm of performance, which is one of the many reasons that I was delighted when Marcus Garley said yes to taking on this translation uh, exercise. And we do call it an exercise because it is a sort of laboratory experiment where we just took language, just. <laughs> I know, that's, that's the big just, right? Yeah, we just took the language, but everything else technically stayed the same. The story stays the same, the characters stay the same. They couldn't fix the play, they couldn't edit the play. I wanted the whole play. Um, uh, and I wanted them, the dramatists, to figure out where were their moments, as you alluded to in your, your opening remarks, uh, Michael, where were their moments where we might, you and I as audience members, might get a little bollocks up in something? You know, are there moments where things kind of get knotted up when they shouldn't be in terms of how the play functions? And this is one of the things we're going to talk about today is sort of the structure of plays and like what's really important about how Shakespeare put plays together. And I think that form and structure are two things that we don't often talk about when we're talking about Shakespeare, partly because we're spending so much time um, focusing on the language, which of course is very important because the language is probably 90%, easily 90% of the communication in a Shakespeare play. You know, that's not necessarily true of a contemporary play, right? Which are more kind of fil filmic in a way, sort of less dialogue and sort of more uh, theatrical action. Do you know what I mean? Just proportionally. But Shakespeare, holy cats, until that sword fight at the end, um, and there's one here, you know, until that fight at the end, there's just a lot of talking. You know, people are really trying to work things out. They're trying to work things out with us, you know, uh, in asides and, and, and soliloquies. And they're, and they're trying to test, you know, um, uh, di different ways of being and negotiating in the world, which I think is really very realistic um, um, to the kind of complicated uh, sense that you you again you mentioned in your introduction, because there are lots of subplots, particularly in this play. My goodness, there's a whole I don't know. There's like two plays smashed into one. I mean, I think you could tell the whole Gloucester sto family story on its own. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it might be kind of satisfying. 
Um, mm. But there, there's, there's the contrast that, that Shakespeare is using. It's a convention. Shakespeare is using a contrast to push, to, to promote things moving forward. And also it's a way to really make characters feel more dimensional, more different kinds of situations that they're in. They react differently like we do, right? I'm always the third child in my family, always. You know, it's like, oh, Louis, she's got those harebrained ideas. Well, yes, I still have those harebrained ideas, but I'm never out of that third. You know what I mean? I'm just never out of that. But now I run a company, which is also strange, but it's like, you know, I'm seen in a different way that way. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm still seen as the third child. Definitely harebrained ideas. But you know what I mean? And so the more situations that these characters can be in, the more dimensional that they feel to us. I just want to take you back uh, to something you mentioned before we get into the form and the structure of this play. You talked about the folio and the quarto and pulling from various sources. Can you describe that a little bit more to us? What is the folio? What is the quarto? How do they come into the 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 creation of the plays that we have now? The, the plays that we have now in translation, or you mean just in general, like editions the, of the plays? The, the, the texts of Shakespeare that we have. Yeah, right. Well, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, the and the, the question about text, uh, you know, what is the authorial, te- you know, what is the text? becomes pretty interesting with uh, about 18 of these plays that we're not so far as we know, or at least I know, and I am no Shakespeare scholar. Everybody would say this. So, you know, you got to take this with a ton of salt. But, um, you know, 18 of them were published for the first time in what was called the first folio of 1623, which was published seven years after Shakespeare's death. Had it not been for um, these two actors in Shakespeare's company uh, spending, you know, those seven years gathering those scripts, and they were all in various uh, they were owned and in various shapes. And so, you know, they, they had to do a lot of kind of detective work and negotiating to get the rights to publish them. Um, uh, we would not have there, there. I think it's like Macbeth and maybe even Midsummer, And, you know, there's some plays we just would not have had or known of. Maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know, but we haven't found some of those, you know, urns yet. Right. But so th- that's kind of interesting to think about sort of like the kind of, Mm, stamp of authority uh, that comes from the publication of, you know, sort of the anthology of someone's works. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so there's that, but then there are other, uh, the other eight, another 18 or so, uh, again, uh, facts are, uh, can be looked up, um, uh, that have sort of like a quarto or like a paperback. It's, it's almost like they were published in, in, during his lifetime. And they were available for people to to, to buy, um, and their differences. And you know, if you know anything about new play development, which I know you do, Michael, my goodness, things change uh, from that first draft to the production draft that you did, you know, at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, to then when you would do it somewhere else. Do you know what I mean? Like these things, like I said, they're living documents. They 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 are adapt. They have to be adaptable because we have so many different components to add to them. And playwrights kind of evolve, you know, try out different things uh, along the way. And it's, you have to be kind of wary a little bit about taking something off the shelf and saying, this is, this is the definitive version of this particular play. We are publishing all 39 of the translations, as I think you know, Michael, of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies as graciously taking on this this huge task, and uh, there's about I don't know eight eight or nine of them that are published already, which is awesome. And we decided that we would publish the draft that was read for the festival in 2019, in which you participated, when we read all 39 of them in chronological order. And so I, I just wanted to mark a moment in time, right, to just say, well, here's what we came up with at this time with this group of artists. And this is always the, this is always the enterprise, Michael. With this group of artists in this space, at this time, for this audience, this is what we've come up with. Plays are always in present tense. I mean, it seems sort of stupid to say that, but they're always in present tense, meaning that I'm going to bring myself into them as a 21st century woman. I'm not, you know, with my own experiences about it. 
I don't know that I can actually go back to 400 years ago and find out what it was or what, you know, what it referenced. I'm not so sure that's really helpful. And I'm not so sure that that's really the, pro- the, the project. I think the project always is how is it relevant today? And point in fact is these plays with their depth of character and with their philosophy of life and death and with the consequences that these characters are faced with, um, they really do replicate a full range of human experiences. And I think that that's one of the many reasons why these plays continue to be so um, important to us and that we continue to dig in and try to find that solve the mystery this time. There is no solving the mystery for all times. There's a, there's a solving the mystery for now. And sometimes in per, um, contemporary production, as you know, we get to a gnarly bit in the passage in the Shakespeare play and we kind of go, well, I don't know. I don't exactly know what that means. So why don't we just cut it out and then we'll just, we're going to move on, you know? And I th- those are legitimate choices to be made. But my interest was what happens if we unpack some of those gnarly bits and that you as actor and I as audience could follow them in the, the logic in the moment of them being uttered, how much more would I get out of the play? And I think that that is one of the great benefits of uh, the next chapter podcast is because it, it is also highlighting only language. I mean, yes, there's wonderful music underscoring and, but you, you're highlighting what we were highlighting in our experiment. And so I love this kind of you know, combination so that people could actually hear these plays without too much interference. You know, sometimes in contemporary production, there's great theatrical choices about where you set it and, you know, who's in what costume and and all that great stuff. But sometimes that's overwhelming to me. And I can't, I can't process all the stimulus that's coming, stimuli that's coming at me. And then I lose the language. And I think that that's, that's sad because I think, again, that's the delivery system in a Shakespeare play, generally speaking, not saying there wasn't some theatricality involved even 400 years ago, but I really, I've, I've come to hear the story. Do you know what I mean? So this is one of the great things about the podcast to me is that we're just hearing the story. And I think that when you hear any of these podcasts, and I think that, um, I think it's definitely going to be true with this King Lear, you're going to hear the play as if, you heard it for the first time. And there's going to be moments where you're like, I had no idea. I, I didn't realize that. And that's to me, the great fun of this whole experiment. Let's take a look. You sent me uh, a little demo of what you're talking about here. Uh, some of King Lear's language as it was in the, we'll call it the original text, even though, as you say, even the original text is marking a moment in time, a moment in Shakespeare's time or shortly after Shakespeare's death. So you sent me uh, the Arden version of King Lear, and then you sent me what we'll call the Gardley version of yeah. King Lear. But here's what's so interesting to me about this particular moment in this play. It's a play that people know per- pretty well, actually, I think, um, particularly people in the theater know it pretty well uh, as well. And um, it, it, it's occurring at a moment in the play where I think that King Lear has gone as far as one could go. He's out on the heath, the storm is a brewing, um, there's all kinds of things happening. Um, and to me, this, this uh, moment, is one in which there is this uh, kind of change of heart. So structurally, this is a very important moment uh, in, in the storytelling uh, of this particular play. And it's, it's about halfway through. I just finished a book by a, a guy named George Saunders, who's a novelist and teaches at Syracuse University. And the, the book is, uh, um, is called A Swim in, Swim in a Pond in the Rain which refers to a moment in a Chekhov a short story. And it's all about structure. And he looks at Russian uh, sh- uh, writers, uh, end of the 19th century. It, it, it's like all in my jam. It's all about structure. But I just want to uh, quote one thing about um, uh, his thoughts uh, about fiction, because this will, I think, lead us to why I, I want us to, to hear this side by, what we call side by side kind of demo. What fiction does It causes an incremental change in the state of a mind. That's it. But you know, it really does it. And I'm here to say that this is the moment 
when there is a, a, an incremental change of mind. And it's an extraordinarily, it's extraordinary moment. And then I'll talk a little bit later about why. So the scene is this, we're on the heath. Um, the storm is coming, right? So if you would read the Shakespeare, uh, Michael, first, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. And then uh, I'll ask you to read Marcus's. Okay. Sure. Right. Prithee, go in thyself. Seek thine own ease. This tempest will not give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more, but I'll go in. In, boy, go first. You houseless poverty. Nay, get thee in. I'll pray and then I'll sleep. Poor naked wretches, wheresoever you are, that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides your looped and windowed raggedness defend you from seasons such as these. Oh, I've taken too little care of this. Take physic, pump. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel, and thou mayst shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. That's great. Thank, thank you. I think I'm following most of it, yeah? But here's what stops me. Take Physic pomp, four syllables. I, I understand it's poetry because it's, it's a compressed, there's a compressed idea built in there. And as the play is going on, I, Louis, cannot get to what it really, translate it fast enough to jump back into the story. So one of the beautiful things about the experiment of play on, I think, is illustrated in what Marcus will do with those four syllables. Because he has determined as a dramatist, and his job is to keep our interest flowing all the way till the end in whatever kind of convention he can use. And in this case, it's got to be language, right? He has determined that this needs to be unpacked a little bit more and paced in the way we can receive it in order to understand how important this moment is for Lear. So when you hear the, Mar the Marcus version now, you'll hear it's not that much different, except there have been some things that have been pulled out to explain more. So if you would read that, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. Go in yourself. Make yourself comfortable. This tempest stops me from thinking thoughts which are more painful, but I'll go in. In, boy, you go first. You poor homeless. No, you go inside. I'll pray and then I'll sleep. You poor naked wretches, wherever you are, you are suffering the pelting of this pitiless storm with no roof over your heads, no fat on your ribs, and only rags for clothing. How will you defend yourselves against such weather? Oh, when I was king, I should have done more for you. It would do you good men who live in luxury, to walk in the shoes of the poor and downtrodden, so that you can unburden yourselves with wealth that you do not need, and show the world that heaven can be fair. That's great. That, thank you. And, and I'm noticing that it's a little different than what you all will be reading um, in, in the podcast. So this is like a, I, I've been using the sample for a really long time, but there's a couple different changes already that, that he's making. And I think that He's always going to kind of go back and forth on some of these changes. But here's what pops. Men who live in luxury. Ah, take physic pomp. Ah, ah, pomp. Men who live in luxury, right? Very mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. Now, was it that clear 400 years ago that pomp meant that to somebody like that? Maybe. But what I'm saying is now I was like, ah, I got the reference so that you can walk in the shoes of the downtrodden. Take physic. Right? Physician, heal thyself. I get that in the moment of hearing it. And to me, it's so extraordinary that this character, who's so far in the play, we have not, hmm, I'm not loving King Lear at this up till now. I mean, he's done some things that I think are kind of not so great. Mm -hmm. um, but starting at the top of this, just this speech, 
that you just read. He says to the fool, you go in first. When was he ever let anybody go ahead of him first? When, 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 when? I don't know. If I were directing the play, it would be like he would always be entering and exiting first until this moment. You know what I mean? Like I would mm -hmm. like physically illustrate it somehow, right? So when has he ever done that? It's like, who? Change. I, I, I need to know that that's like different. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and then he has a revelation about, uh, you know, somebody else's feelings. When has he ever had, a, when has he cared about anyone else's feelings? Ever. He certainly didn't care about his daughter Cordelia, right? So again, two, that's a second kind of clue, like who, something's, something's stirring inside this, this, this person, right? Three, when I was king, I should have done more. Whoa, right? Acknowledgement, admittance, like um, I'm part of the problem. Right, this is really the moment of realization for him yeah. that there is a world out there that he had all of this power exactly. and didn't use it properly. Exactly. And then he turns to you and me and says, hey, don't do what I did. It's the awakening to the fact that there are other people out there, that he is not the center of the universe, that actually there are there is much work to be done right and in these i don't know 12 lines i actually like the guy now right because what he has realized is an is a truth about his own behavior the fact that he and earlier in the earlier in the play it's not that long uh ago that he has said something to the fool about I done her wrong kind of thing with to, to Cardiola. So there's, there's it's inklings. Funny. Again, it's incremental. There's inklings. And this is the thing you chart when you do like a structural analysis, like where these moments start to like, uh, hit, you know, hit away at the armor, right? So, he, so you know that, you know that, you heard him say it. He's realized that he has done her wrong. And what follows this particular moment, and I'm assuming is happening in, in the podcast. I didn't get a chance to read the whole, the whole script yet, but I'm, I'm delighted that I have it, but is a trial scene, right? You, you're going to do the trial. Yes. Right. right. And we put the two, the two on he trial. Imagines, he imagines he imagines his daughters so, on right. trial. Exactly. Right. So he puts them on trial so that he knows that they are, they really have, he listened wrongly to, you know, he listened to them and he has now, he has to like, take care of them. And to me, Michael, the tragedy of King Lear is that now he knows the truth. He knows he must do something to uh, fix what he broke and he will not be able to do it for so many reasons. There are obstacles in his way for the rest of the play, but that is the energy that drives the rest of the play for him is that he must now, you know, make amends with Cordelia. And of course, that's that moment at the end where they do have that Right, that that he has made amends. Right. So he can't fix the world that he broke, but he can make that amends, and that is to so moving to me as a daughter. I'm like, okay, right, that have uh, somebody that you you know your father uh, make that kind of uh, 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 admission, uh, you know, um, come to that kind of conclusion. I mean, this is very powerful stuff, and so to me, this moment is at the beginning of sort of that rectif rectifying, you know, remedying what he has broken. And so the fact that Marcus has taken such time to kind of unpack these four particular um, new pieces of information. My God, could there be a speech more dramatic with four different pieces of things, moving things forward in a compressed period of time? Actually, I don't know of one. Well, actually I do. There's a lot in Shakespeare, sorry. But it's a great, it's a great example of what the play on translation effect was meant to uh, illuminate. And in the podcast, it's great because we don't have the visual, right? I mean, it, you could right. say pomp, you could, you could totally, give yourself totally. some physical language totally. if, you're, if you're on stage and the audience will understand it more or less. 
But here we don't have the visual, we only have the words. And with that translation, we get it. We get it the way we would if we could see it a, a lot better. I wonder, Louis, can you take us through, you've talked about uh, form and structure and, and how a play functions. Can you walk us through, you did a little bit already with Lear, but, but take, a, take it from the top, if you would, and, and walk us through the, the form and the structure of Lear as, as you understand it. Well, it, 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 it can be done kind of simply. Mia Gosling in her you know, good tickle brain, three panel Shakespeare has it down pretty, pretty, pretty pat. You know, um, uh, King Lear is a terrible father and banishes his younger daughter. First panel. King Lear goes mad and wanders around in a heath in a storm. Second panel. Almost everyone dies. Third panel. There's the play. You know, a little bit of judge, a <laughs> little bit of judgy. I don't know, terrible father. I mean, maybe. Yeah. A little judgy. But right. There's the play. Right. It is. Mm -hmm. This is what this is what happens. You know, beginning, a middle and end uh, and, and where things sort of change. And I think that um, there is a, a kind of um, pattern that Shakespeare employs in all of his plays uh, that uh, really kind of follows a sense of using contrast to propel action forward. And so you're always looking for contrast. Like I said, this is why the Gloucester story is so uh, important. It's a parallel story, but it's also in contrast and, and sometimes in sync with what's, what's happening with Lear as if it, to, to help emphasize, I think, you know, sort of to give us a, like the, the sense of weight of it. Um, and so, uh, generally speaking, these plays start in one kind of place. You know, we, we I don't know, Malcolm Gladwell said we make assessments about people in 1.8 seconds or something like that. I was like, I, I don't know how he came up with that or how psychologists came up with that. But I do think we make assessments about people pretty dang fast, right? So at the beginning of a play, generally speaking, you kind of have an assessment about, about somebody and, you know, we get some evidence that perhaps the decisions that Lear makes, you know, are rash or not um, completely thought through, you know, did he have that sense of, uh, was this just pomp? Was this just a, right, just a um, public showing of something that had already been divvied up and, and uh, Cordelia didn't follow the script? I don't know, there's a lot of different choices, as you know, as an actor, you get to make in these plays. But the fact is that she's banished, there's the beginning of the play. Now I got an attitude about that already, right? It's like, ooh, wrong, wrong. Those other two are so obviously not, you know, you know, our playing dad. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, 15 years ago, I, I, I thought the daughters had a point of view about dads. Now I'm, as I'm older, I'm like, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, uh, uh, all these characters have, 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 have some reason for doing what they're doing. It's not, they're not just that cut and dried, uh, in my opinion. Again, this is why, why Shakespeare is so great, because everybody has dimensionality to, to, to them, to be mined, can, can be mined. And so you, you comb through the play as, as, as bits accumulate, right? We are taking in information. This is true of any play we're seeing. We're taking in information and we're trying to like cobble together sort of like, what's the real thing going to be about? What's going to be worked out in this play? And when Lear makes this, what I consider to be a fatal mistake, which is banishing Cordelia, I think to myself, oh, the rest of the play is going to be working this out. And point in fact is that's true, right? How do we get back to, can we get back to making it whole? And point, point in fact is in a tragedy, which is a genre, a kind of form, but a genre, it's not about putting the world back together again. Curiously, comedy is more about putting the world back together again, but not, not tragedy. And that is true of how this is going to function. But uh, you, we're going through accumulating information, you know, and trying to see where are those moments of turn of of revel revelation or, or, or of an of an acknowledgement or a realization of something not being the way you thought it was as a character, and by extension, how I think about it as audience members, right? Because you're trying to change my mind from how I think about this character at the beginning to how I think about this character at the end. And often how Shakespeare does that is he starts in one kind of world of uh, view and th the language in this play in the first half is very formal actually. And it begins to um, 
morph into sort of, you know, less formal language toward the end, which I find fascinating too. If you just roll, if you just ride that um, um, melodically, right, uh, that, there, that, that your body would sort of chemically be, be, be moved along as well. And the, the great gift of Shakespeare is that everything in these plays, in spite of four and four, you know, three hours and 45 minutes of Hamlet or whatever, everything is in there to move this, move me and you as a collective from one thing to the next. It's a little easier in um, some other plays like um, Romeo and Juliet, beginning in a comedy, ending in a tragedy, for instance, right? Playing with genre as well. But there's something about the world that is set up and who I think that character is and how much I don't. I don't care for that character at the beginning. I'm not sure I'm gonna give that character a whole heck of a lot of time to sort of prove themselves. But bit by bit, as more things, as more information is accumulated, particularly in the first half of the play until we get to that moment that you just read, then I see that there's potential for, for redemption and forgiveness. So what, what happens is that um, we meet this character uh, with evidence by what they do, what they say, what others say about them and how, you know, how we have this instant feeling about this character. And in a good play, our sense of this is going to change. And bit by bit in this play, even at its length, um, all of the things in the play are needed to kind of chip away at my own assessment of the character, but and also the 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 way the actions uh, uh, on the character of the character by the character, a, a, until we get to that moment, you know, uh, uh, as you as you read, where suddenly the pieces are enough to have tipped it over into a knowing thing, like like he can't he can't not absorb it anymore or acknowledge it, like it's. You know what I mean? It's like it's enough pieces of information and it tips, it tips him over. And then the rest of the play is about dealing with that revelation, right? You've been in those plays, that, right, Michael? I mean, the second half, it is, it is then narrows itself down to like, we're going to deal with this. We're going to conclude this particular line. This is what it's all about now. He's got to get back and remedy what he did. And there's way too many obstacles. And that's the second half of the play. There's way too many obstacles that get in the way of him physically, literally getting back, right? Um, but that it's not so much that he has to, I think, um, you know, politically rectify the world per se, that the emotional value to me is, of course, that's that, that scene with Cordelia and that I have not been in these, you know, situations of royal, uh, uh, you know, the consequences of royalty kind of collapsing and falling apart and making bad decisions. A lot of these Shakespeare plays, as you know, do deal with leadership, right? And and um, how devastating those consequences are for the rest of us. <laughs> when leaders make these decisions, you're like, no, no, please don't do that. Oh, my God, you just did that. And oh, well, uh, kingdoms just fell, you know, for that. But metaphorically, think of it metaphorically, right? And I think that that's one of the beautiful uh, ways in which, again, Shakespeare shines is partly because of the use of the poetry, which is, which is metaphorical, right? And, and makes us listen and lean in and try to unpack some of those moments um, in, in a way that's very active. You can't be passive listening to Shakespeare or watching Shakespeare. You just cannot. And this is an interesting challenge for us today, right, Michael? Because so much of our entertainment, uh, so much of our theatrical entertainment is passive. Television is passive. Film is passive. I mean, in some ways, podcasts are passive, right? Mm -hmm. But going to the theater is active sport. And I want Shakespeare to be an active sport again, as it was 400 years ago. And I, I do think, and I've obviously set up a whole company of belief, that if we could unpack some of the gnarly bits along the way, that you and I, you as actor and me as audience, will stay in that story longer and make it more moment to moment, you know, believable in the sense of this is what sh what would happen based on the facts of the play, based on what well, the facts of the play that we know so far that we've been able to understand so far, the facts, like who's doing what to whom and why, 
you unpack some of this stuff in these history plays and it's like, oh my God, I had no idea what the beef was. I knew there was a beef, but I didn't know what the beef specifically was. Now I specifically know what the beef is. And I'm like, hey, you got a beef or oh, you're lame. But now I know and I'm engaged now, right? Versus kind of mm, theoretically kind of engaged. Like, yeah, I kind of get it. He's got a beef, but I don't know what it is. Now I know. You cannot listen to that moment in Marcus's translation now and not know that Lear knows and you know what's going to happen now. You are now on Lear's, with Lear on his journey, on their journey. I shouldn't genderize it. Right? And that is extraordinary. And this is all by the, mm, the rails. This is all structural rails. Language is a convention that he uses. Plot points are a convention that he uses. Character are, are conventions that he uses. Uh, going from comedy to tragedy, uh, public to private, uh, prose to po po all of this letters are conventions that he uses to move things forward. And once you understand those, I think, and thinking about it like a ride at the amusement park, like what's the ride? Michael, you're going to take me on. And where are the dips and where is it written? And when's it slow? And when it's like, oh, hairpin turn. Like that brings some energy to it and makes it kind of a sport. And like, I got to hang on, right? I got to hang on to the rails. Um, and that's the experience I want. I want to be dragged around like it's a, a roller coaster ride. So I look at the structure of these plays like they're roller coaster rides. Like, what is, the, how are they built? How are they built? What are they made of? And that's been one of the great outcomes of this exploration that we've been doing with these, with these writers and, and these plays is to, to understand a little bit better about how they're built and how they work. I love what you said about the use of language and how language changes in the course of the play to reflect uh, really what's going on, that it is so formal in the beginning that Lear starts with, no, we have divided in three our kingdom and it is our intent. Da, 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 da. It's like a, a, a long a written out speech. And we end with howl, howl, howl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That everything explodes in that first scene. Tell us about uh, two characters that seem sort of to be manifestations of that explosion. One is Kent and the other is the fool. Kent, who has this very clear formal role as King Lear's right hand, is banished and comes back as someone else, literally, to take on that same role again, but has had to change himself or herself, themselves completely. The fool, who also, it seems, has always been there by Lear's side, he keeps calling for his fool, his fool, his fool. We don't see the fool until after all of this has happened. And clearly the fool comes in with a different relationship to the king that he had before, based on the fact that he's banished his most beloved member of the household, Cordelia. Yeah, well, I think, you know, had the fool been in that scene, I'm not sure it would have happened. Do, do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. Kent can protest, but... It's a really interesting question about sort of um, relationship to power, right? If Lear is the power, the figure of power, which which um, they are in this play, Kent is the formal public um, uh, aide de camp, uh, loyalist, right, uh, par excellence. And it's such an interesting concept. Uh, it's really a lot of research about fools and you know, in 14, 15, 1600s. Um, and us all, I, I always uh, like to be that kind of character to, to do, 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 sorry, to the directors in a rehearsal room. Just like I could say anything and it's okay. And there's like no consequences to me. Um, you know, try not to embarrass you publicly, but you know, I, I, I like to be that, that person too. And it's such an interesting concept to, uh, to think about a leader being confident enough in a weird way uh, to have some, you know, uh, allow someone. I mean, that seems a weird thing too, but perhaps I think they call loud fools or something like that is what it's called, right? 400 years ago to have that, that role. But that person is not in that scene. I have seen productions where the fool is in that scene, 
And they find that kind of interesting because that's a different kind of information about it. But the fool does not speak, not in the play. So uh, it's very interesting that the fool is silenced at that point. It's such a such a very interesting moment, right? Um, uh, and and then comes in later and and really um, kind of begins to nip and chip away at Lear's decision at, at the right at the at it being the right decision. And I think that the fool has that great role to be allowed to chip away at at Lear's sort of supreme confidence that it was a rational choice. It wasn't irrational when it seemed pretty obvious to us in the staging of it as you you know you if we see it generally speaking it seems very irrational because kent also calls him out on that right um and even in the hearing of it i'm, I'm assuming it's going to we're going to hear kent say these things right so they're an interesting contrast the two of them and uh, of course the fool then ends up dying you know halfway through through the play uh, after after the heath, and I've always kind of, I don't know, sort of assumed, you know, the fool gets pneumonia or something. You know, I'm not exactly sure. Um, uh, I haven't really parsed out so much yet uh, why that character does not have much more of a function in the second half. Although I think it's because Lear doesn't need somebody to tell them the truth. I right. think Lear, Lear, Lear knows the truth. The fool is there to be a truth teller, to speak truth to power. Yeah. And then in that scene, in that part that we read together, yeah, that's his Lear's awakening and, and right. no he did, yeah, yeah. No, no longer needs the fool because he he the character now knows the truth. You know, the carryover for Kent all the way through the play, is, as you say, it's this beautiful, it's a beautiful line, isn't it? Uh, arc of a character, but there there that character stays true to themselves all the way through. Their, their um, strategies and tactics change, but their, their motivation and their eye on the prize, which is honoring Lear and, and willing to, to the death, is very clear and sort of solid. And it is a great... Um, What's the word I want? I want to say anchor in a way throughout the whole play that at least we know that there's the Kent line. Hmm. And we, if we believe Kent as the loyal, you know, we take Kent at face value, which I think we're, we're to do. There really is no kind of subtext about it, really. It, Kent is as Kent presents. And that we admire that character. We may think, ooh, a little foolish, perhaps, you know, to follow that guy, uh, you know, or to follow the king. Um, uh, then I it, I have an anchor all the way through that if somebody like Kent believes so much in in this in this character that there's something that's not right with Lear um, at this stage in Lear's life and I think that Marcus talks a lot about this uh, when he talks about how the how the story how the story lands with him personally. And uh, who that character Lear is, and what Lear is, is struggling with uh, mentally, you know, cognitively, you know, at that that the, at that point uh, in his life, and you know, there's references that Reagan and Donald make about so like, whoa, that seemed like out of ordinary, or you know, like, where did that come from? And uh, the behavior is erratic, you know, uh, all these kinds of hints and tips at sort of the at perhaps a deteriorating mental state for Lear as well. And if, if that component is added into my accumulation of knowledge about the character, by the time uh, Lear has this revelation then, and I know then that we're, we're on this journey together to, to sort of solve it, remedy it, I also know that it's not going to be possible because of a deteriorating mental condition. On top of everything, all the other obstacles, right? And this again is uh, the beauty of Shakespeare. How many layers can he put into all of these uh, events? Quite a few. And that there's a lot for all of us to grab. There's enough for all of us to kind of grab one of them to sort of follow. And I do know that for, for Marcus, it had a really po poignant, uh, personal 
um, the, the journey of that, the sort of the mental state of that character was, was his entry into, into it. And I think it's a marvelous uh, perspective. And I, I think it's a, 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 a flavor of that character that may not always be uh, highlighted in production. Let's talk about Edmund and Edgar. Well, uh, I'll say that uh, in this play in particular, I think Shakespeare uses pairings as uh, in a contrast and Edmund and Edgar are kind of a, a stellar example of you know, a pair in, in, in contrast. You know, and I've often kind of wondered uh, if put together, they're kind of one character, you know, or sort of one fulsome character. This sometimes is a um, a statement about Shakespeare's characters feeling that they're you know maybe one or two dimensions at best, and I don't think that's true. I actually think that all of them have the potential to be three uh, you know three dimensional, and by that I mean they all uh, what 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 a three dimensional character, and by extension a three dimensional person, is that we do things differently in different circumstances. You know, you could kind of argue that Kent in some ways is two-dimensional in the fact that he, that, that character is always going to kind of be loyal to Lear, except that um, there's a feistiness that happens in Kent, right? I mean, sort of like, whoa, where'd that come from? I, I didn't see that in the court, you know what I mean? So that there's, that, that there's a reaction in the moment. So in other words, you're paying attention and you're present and you're in the moment. Um, and and uh, there's uh, interesting kind of dynamics with those two those two brothers uh, in terms of how they respond to things uh, as the play goes on. And um, uh, like Kent, Edgar has to also kind of put uh, himself in disguise, right, uh, to manifest you know, sort of a kind of truth or sort of, I'm not sure that it's all that well thought through about what's the consequence of, of making this choice, except sort of uh, one of, of, of a kind of a survival uh, t- t- tactic at the moment, you know what I mean? Like, I, I got to go into size. I mean, th- this is to me is the beautiful thing. Again, when you're unpacking Shakespeare, I think through these translations, I mean, the Macbeths, I'm sorry, they did not have this all planned out. They didn't. I feel like it's moment to moment. They're kind of making it up. And I, I mean, I find that funny that they're kind of making it up. Yeah, it has horrible consequences. I, I understand what I'm saying, but I find it funny, you know, that they're like, well, why don't we try this? I mean, it's like something out of, um, you know, that 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 funny ad uh, about like if you're in a horror film, you know, don't go into the, you know, right into right. That's what the Macbeths do. They like go into that shed with all the axes. I'm like, oh my God. Anyway, I find that funny. You know, you know, okay, I have a wide sense of humor. But it, it, it's also true here in a weird way. That there, there's these kind of things that, just, uh, um, that cause a reaction. You know, uh, laughter is a physical reaction. It's a response to something. It's always legitimate, in my opinion. Laughter in the theater is always legitimate. And if you don't like it, then we have to figure out like what what is being said or done that's eliciting that physical response from me. But I think that the two of them are so kind of um, obvious at the beginning, right? That they're so, they're so obvious. And so what happens, you know, as we are following those and do we ever oversect, you know, do I change my mind slightly? Does Edmund ever really get to a point for me where I kind of go, well, that was, you're taking great advantage of things or is it just really kind of always the same reaction in all scenes? And he might be that. I haven't studied it closely, but he might be a little that sociopathically. Do you know what I mean? Like that some characters, some people are that way, that they always kind of respond the same way, no matter what the situation is. Well, and, in a way, he's he's the good son in in in, in an upside down world. Well, yeah, because he's done. He's <laughs> right. he's he's right. living up to the expectations that his father presents. This is my bastard son, my bastard, bastard, bastard. Yeah, true. That's very good. Yeah, that's very good. That's very good. Well, and Gloucester has that big moment too when, you know, is it Reagan who finally says, oh, your son is the one who gave it, gave, gave away, gave it away or whatever it was, right? Isn't there some big moment? So, um, you know, even Gloucester has that kind of revelation too. I mean, and how does Edgar become sort of that good son? That's the journey. How does Edgar become that good son? If Edmund is seen as the good son at the beginning and Edgar's son of the suspicious one. And, you know, while we may 
not know one way or the other. It's like he 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 does kind of run away right away. It's like, why? Why don't you just say, hey, I don't know what that is. You, you kind of wonder. People are not very good communicators in Shakespeare. You kind of wonder, why don't you just say, hey, I didn't write that, Dad. What the hell's the matter with you? You know, right. oh, no, no, I run away. It's like, well, you just made yourself suspicious. Now I'm suspicious. I'm like, who are you? So to watch that journey too, right, which is kind of a Kent-like, the switcheroo between, you know, who's the good son and who's the bad son and who they are at the end is completely opposite. So that 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 is a to me kind of a clear and sort of obvious kind of pairing use of pairing and contrast that kind of move us from one emotional state and assumption and judgment about character and you know how these people should be. You know we're all very good about like how everybody should be doing things, uh, but versus the end of like oh you know there really were some things that they were challenged with and they they came out. Uh, as as they could, um, you know, given all the circumstances that they had, um, and having more compassion uh, for people, so, I think is really a great outcome, you know, of, of of this play. It's so interesting and and curious to me, you know, why does Edgar take so long to reveal his I- true identity to his father after his father's been blinded? Yeah. It's yeah. almost vindictive in a way. Yeah. The extent to which he goes you know, leading him on and leading him on and, yeah, and having him believe, having his father believe that he's killed himself. And it, it it's, it's almost like Edgar needs all of that to bring himself to forgive his father forever. Doubting yeah. Him. Or it's, yeah, that's good. I mean, it's kind of Edmund like, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is a strange, yeah, it, it's a great question. And um, I think that why we do what we do is an impossible question to answer. Yeah. Any given day, I'll have a different answer to you for the same question of why. And if there's some way uh, that we could just be in the road or the ride, rather, the ride of this play, I think if we ever ask why in the, while we're watching or hearing or reading, then I think that Th- there may be a problem in a way, you know, of why, really why doesn't really, Cordelia, really, you know, yeah. why, why doesn't Cordelia just play along, just play along. Everything's going to be fine. Well, there'd be no play then if that right. happened. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there would be no play. Um, but we all, we have these moments, Michael, we have these moments that irrevocably change our lives. And I know sometimes when you see it on stage, you think, well, that's not believable. And I thought, oh, really? Oh, really? Of course, one moment changes your life. You're breathing and then you're not. That is about as irrevocable as it gets. And that, by the way, is human life. So don't tell me that your life could not, you know, your child was born. One moment, Nancy's pushing. And then the next moment, your child is born. Do not tell me that your life was not irrevocably changed in a moment. And one of the things that Shakespeare is great at dramatizing is these moments of irrevocable change. And the minute she says nothing or (sighs) irrevocably changed, right? Is there a possible for, is there a possibility? And once this happens, right? This happens. And this happens in the beginnings of these plays, right? Once this big moment happens, is there the opportunity for redemption, forgiveness, compassion? Are these the questions that Shakespeare is ans- asking? I think that he might be, or I'll just say, I think he is, and I love that I'm being asked to reevaluate. And sometimes it takes a lot of text to get there, to get me to be moved too, I get it. And to think about 1,200 people or however many people at the globe, with their varying experiences and interests and, you know, who is paying attention all the time? I don't know. I mean, it sounds like a great free for all, you know, you as actor would have had to work really hard to get people's attention. But my guess is that they were gripped from the beginning because of the way Shakespeare sets up stories that they were gripped from the beginning and that they were in it to win it from beginning to end. And that was the joy of that experience. And that's the joy I want to have as a modern audience member. What do you make of the last line of the play that Edgar says, we that are young 
have never seen so much nor lived so long, something that I'm paraphrasing. Well, in some versions, it's Albany um, who has the last line. So um, I don't know what I make of that either. Um, you know, uh, a couple things. One is, I think there was a convention that Shakespeare used often at the ends of scenes to let me know that it was the end of a beat. Cause there's kind of like these two line little aphorismistic kind of things that sometimes, you know, you'd say at the end and they kind of rhyme and you're like, well, they, you know, I don't know if that actually makes any sense in the context of the scene, but I always take it as kind of a hint, like, Oh, that's we're we're stopping that for now. Then we're going to go on to something else. If you believe as I believe that tragedy does not end. I mean, the end is not, I mean, it has to end. I mean, the play has to end, but what, what we're left with is what we have to work out about the fact that a world has been completely wiped out. By the way, no women left in the story. Mm. Now, I think personally that a world without women is like not a good world. So uh, I, I love that there are women in the beginning of this play and there's no women at the end. I'm like, hey, what's the morale, you know, moral of that story, guys? Mm -hmm. Like that just is not good. Right. And when all the women and children are killed in Macbeth and it's only just like men only or whatever that old masculine issue is, it's like, hmm, interesting to me. And that's sort of the way that those are those stories. How we interpret them 400 years later is 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 really kind of exciting in terms of the options of like who is represented in these stories. But I just say that there is a wipeout of people. Almost everyone dies, according to Mia Gosling, right? Almost everyone dies. What the hell is left, Michael? Do we have to scrape everything off in order to begin again? And if we do, how do we do that? That's act six. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. How do we do that as feeling compassionate, forgiving, perhaps rational people? who have just witnessed the consequences of not paying attention, right? And not caring for others until somebody finally does, you know, until Lear kind of realizes, oh, like you said, not center of the universe, which of course that character had been probably since babyhood told that they were the center of the universe. Do you know what I mean? Like that whole guy grooming into, I mean, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, I don't know that the, it's necessarily like the wrap up of a of the whole story that couplet or, or quartet or whatever it is that that um, Albany slash Edgar says says at the end. But in some ways, it's kind of like one of those things. It always kind of strikes me as like one of those things you say at a at a horrific event when you don't really know what to say. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, you know, it's almost, it's not banal necessarily, but it's kind of like um, sort of a, a stock phrase, in, you know, kind, kind of thing. Because what can you say at the end of this when, when you have just witnessed what you have just witnessed and we have felt what we have just felt? I mean, he had to end it somehow, you know. And, and I think that everybody got up and danced at the end too, by the way, which was, you know, an Elizabethan convention. And I kind of love thinking about that because it was like, yeah, that was that story. Blah, 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 blah. And now it's just remember and that's all like, the uh, actors. So all, yeah, the, all actors the actors would have gotten yeah. on the stage. I, I, I think I, I like to believe that. I kind of love that because it's a great contrast too, right? I, I so I, I kind of love that there was this convention. Um, and maybe not in mid mid maybe not 1605, 1606 by then, but I certainly think it was true in some of the earlier plays. But um yeah, that's kind of what I make of it. I don't I don't uh, unpack a lot of meaning in it. I, I feel like it's one of those things that just kind of passes through and not a summation uh, necessarily because there can be no summation. The idea is not to sum. The idea is that it it's still a pro there's a problem we have to we have to now deal with. Right. If we allow the world to get like that, we still have to deal with it. It's not wrapped up neatly and like, yeah, I can put that episode away. Right. It's like saying what do we make of this? We got to make something of this. We got to yeah. do something. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned Albany. Uh, Albany, I think, 
is is Albany the only character who essentially switches sides, starting first with Goneril, his his wife, and then eventually going over and siding with Edgar against Edmund and helping Lear's army? Yeah, perhaps, perhaps, but don't forget that second servant. Oh. That is one of the most poignant moments in the right. play, in my opinion, when, you know, they poke out the one eye. OK, that's bad enough. But they're about to poke out Gloucester's second eye and the second servant, maybe. I think it's some. you know, I don't think it's a named character, mm-hmm. purposely not a named character. Somebody who has absolutely no power mm-hmm. says, no, that's not right. Good grief, Michael. It takes, you know, that I care to, to speak what we all believe. Like, that's not right. And has the temerity, courage to say it? Of course, this character is going to lose their life because of it. Holy cats. I think that's one of the bravest things, maybe in all of Shakespeare. That moment. And the 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 um the turn that that had you know so there was a character kills Cornwall that, yeah I mean, that, that yeah well it does yes right right in, not maybe not inadvertently but yes uh, it, it ha- provides the fatal stab right but after also, saying I've as, served as you Cornwall. my I've yeah. I've served you my whole life yep I've been devoted to you but I've never done better service than this to tell you to stop yep. blinding Gloucester yep. And is thrust into a fight, but and and yep. strikes a fatal blow against Cornwall, and then is killed by Regan. Yeah, it is an incredible, incredible character and in, in turn. Where are those people now? <laughs> well, we're around. Yeah, do it in different ways and where you can, and in the circumstances that shed. But again. There was a moment that irrevocably changed that character's life and in some ways really, you know, um, fast, uh, fast tracks the play too. like it's a jolt to the play to see who's going to who's going to win, you know, which forces are going to win. Right. Um, And it's an action that catapults it uh, into the sort of last third um, uh, of, of this race. You know who's who's going to get there, and then there's literally a race, right? Because Cordelia and the King of France, the King of France, she marries France, right? Right. The King of France, they're they're on the scene soon thereafter, around that time. So there really is this kind of like uh, march toward you know some kind of conflagration, and that's the thing that propels it. It's it's pretty. It doesn't get much more dramatic than that, you know. We could keep talking about this story forever. Obviously, it's it's got so much in it. Is there anything else that you want to convey that we should be listening for throughout these episodes? Yeah, I do think that there are some um, motifs, if I could use a musical term. I, and I do think Shakespeare thought of this. And, you know, again, this is one of the reasons that uh, people uh, are so gravitated toward the power of the poet poetic structure and the poetry in these plays. But I, I do think there's some, some things you could listen for, um, uh, include references to, and even particularly words to, things like vision, seeing, nature, uh, the gods. I mean, this is set pre, oh, is it pre-Christian Britain? I mean, it's 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 certainly a, 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 a story from the from the way past right um nakedness authority foolishness nothingness divided bodies um madness disguise um and lastly And this might be a little hard to listen for and a little easier to do in a production when language can't express, you know, that there are silences and there A and B, then there's inadequate communication. And I think that there's a lot of inadequate communication in a lot of these plays 
Which I think, unfortunately, kind of reflects all of us in our inadequate ability to communicate with one another. I mean, I'm not so sure that we all learn how to do that really well. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot not said. And this is true in all these places, but I think this is true, true in this play too. So if there's, if there's moments where, you know, what language can't express and um, as, you, as you're listening along, I think that um, uh, the podcast, uh, especially in its episodic structure, in, in, in bites that I think we can kind of grasp in sort of, you know, hearing, you know, really kind of deeply listening to. Um, is going to be such a saturated event in a weird way that uh, that having kind of a, you know, not it's nine episodes, right? So in, in those kind of chunks, it's sort of like, I think that'd be very satisfying because of its saturation, but it, because it's going to be such a saturated event, I'm not sure it can carry all, all the way through in, in one hearing. Although I like to listen to them both ways, but I just think this is an awesome opportunity um, to really listen deeply uh, to a, a writer, uh, two writers actually, Shakespeare and Gardley, who are really writing at sort of the height of their of their um, writing careers, I think, and are kind of really on the top of their game. And so to listen to that, I think is gonna be an extraordinary experience. From your mouth to all of our ears. Thank you very much, Louis. I appreciate your walking us through this play and all of its complexity and all of its layers, all of its motifs and meanings. Uh, obviously not all of it because we can only scratch the surface with, with these great, great stories and people will continue to write about them and rewrite them and do all kinds of things for, for years and years to come. But Indeed. Uh, it's been a great exploration with you and I look forward to the next one. Thank you, Michael, for asking me. It's been, it was fun talking with you about it. You've been listening to bonus content at Next Chapter Podcasts. You can learn more about us by going to ncpodcasts.com. That's N as in next, C as in chapter, podcasts.com. And from there, you can navigate to all kinds of different series that we're producing, including other play on podcasts and the bonus content that accompanies them from Macbeth, to A Midsummer Night's Dream, to Pericles, and coming up next, King Lear. I look forward to talking to you there.